Well, 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 ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Forum Night 2. Welcome, welcome, welcome. The Forum, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. This is a place where we can have a discussion about intelligent answers, caring answers to properly engage our culture with the issues that, are, are, that really matter. These are the things you face in your schools, in your workplace, in your sporting grounds. These are the things that matter. Last week we uh, had Dave Pillo come and uh, speak to us about abortion and euthanasia. And by the way, you can uh, check out the entire service. If you missed that, you can check that out on our Facebook page. Uh, the entire presentation in the Q&A is on there. So go ahead and check that out. Tonight we have Pastor George Saloom talking about gender and sex. Are they different? That's what he uh, hopes to, to answer tonight. But before we do that, remember we have a Q&A at the end of the, the, of the presentation. Uh, the number should be, be behind me at the moment. Take, uh, write down that number. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, text it to that number and we'll try and answer those questions for you. I do ask that you keep the questions on topic. We don't want to have any random questions. We want to keep, uh, keep it on topic. Uh, so you can do that. But without further ado, let me please introduce to you our pastor, Pastor George Saloon. All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So good to have you all here today. It really was an honor to have Dave Pillow with us here last week. And uh, quite a few people have been watching the, uh, the uh, presentation from last week about abortion and euthanasia. So David, thank you once again for your care and responsibility and love in delivering such a very uh, hotly debated or, or emotionally charged topic. So really appreciate you doing that. And uh, if you haven't seen that, like Jared just said, you can go to our Facebook page and uh, scroll down and that will be there as well. Well, today it is a, a presentation, and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A uh, session at the end because that really helps us understand uh, some things. If you have questions of people you know, maybe these are this sort of an issue that we're talking about today, maybe you haven't faced it yet like you would have with abortion or euthanasia, but it is a very relevant topic. What we're seeing happening in America, in Canada, and in England generally happens in most Western nations. It's like a bit of a wave that happens, and Australia is one of the last... Uh, to, uh, to get that wave, but nonetheless, we do get that wave. And so, um, so today, that's what we want to talk about. So to please uh, throw the questions along. And as Jared said, um, keep on topic, but also any questions we don't get through today, we will uh, answer throughout the week. So we will personally, uh, individually answer every single question like we have from last week uh, to you. We'll reply to the number. So the number that was on the screen behind us before and is on the screen uh, throughout the night is a prepaid number. We don't know anyone's numbers, so people are a little apprehensive to ask a question that they think, oh, they might have my number. We don't know who it is. And so please excuse the fact that we just say, hey, when we reply to you individually, because we don't know who you are, okay? So just want to let you know that. So it's a very safe place to do that. Let me pray before we start uh, talking about this topic. Father, I thank you that tonight, as last, last Sunday night was, that it be covered in prayer. Let it be covered by your love and your grace. Let tonight be covered by an understanding, my God, so that we can see the person, not just the problem. We get to see the questioner, not just the question. Let us be a, a community of believers that loves people for who they are and leaves everything else up to you. Father, let tonight be a night of understanding so that we may be able to love people in a greater measure in the name of Jesus. We all said... Amen. Well, this topic, I believe, is starting to become a defining topic of this generation. This topic is not something that I think is going to just leave very quickly. This is not a, a topic that I, that I think is going to just come and go. It's going to be a fly-by-night, um, you know, uh, shooting star. Uh, people are just talking about it. It's the latest thing to come out, and then it's gone. I, I think this topic is going to become a very hotly debated, very uh, big topic for many people to try and battle with or, or wrestle with, I should say. And, um, and part of the reason for that is that laws are changing to ensure that this topic becomes enshrined in our system and in our culture. Laws are changing rapidly in Canada. Uh, only a few months ago, and I'll speak about this a little bit more, uh, their Human Rights Commission and their hate speech laws changed to include the plethora of genders. And so, uh, so 
Uh, already in, in the first three months after its in introduction, a law professor, a, a university professor, was hauled in before the Gender and Equality Commission in her university for showing a video um, of two different views of gender, and the one that the university did not agree with, uh, she was she was uh, made in massive trouble with for doing that. So. Um, they were going to take some legal proceedings, but some people have, have risen up to try and support her in that scenario, and none, none less than a Jordan Peterson, who most of you would have heard of, uh, at least through the news, probably painted badly, but an incredible crusader. He's the guy that I've spoken about in church, who really is finding God in the public sphere um, through his endeavors of trying to understand human connection and human behavior. So this topic is not a, is not a fly-by-night. What has happened uh, for thousands of years is we've known the difference or, or the similarities of gender and sex. We've understood those definitions. For thousands of years, uh, uh, they've been used interchangeably that your sex or your gender was the same in all legal documents, speech, in science. But for some reason in this recent times, we've denounced that knowledge for no logic, no reasoning, no scientific purposes this knowledge all of a sudden is starting to take a back seat and no one really knows why. Sometimes it's believed that kindness has been the reason why laws needed to change, but I don't think compelled kindness is kindness at all. And I'll explain that in a minute. The difficulty with this whole issue is that we're dealing with abstracts. We're not dealing with anything solid. What I mean by that is, is that we're not dealing with a a scientific truth that can be proven, we're dealing with feelings throughout this whole topic. This is about an individual person's feelings, not about a scientific truth or a fact or anything that can be proven or repeated in scientific experiments. This is something that is all based on abstract feeling. How do people feel about what their gender is? Not what someone assigns to them, but how they feel. And because we're dealing with abstract, how do you make laws about something that's abstract? How do you make laws about your feelings and that person's feelings and the other person's feelings and this person's feelings? I, I can imagine for the older generation that are here today and the older generation in our nation, we get a little confused when we see that people get offended by what someone else says and then they want, is <laughs> the funny part, not that they get offended, but then they want repercussions against the person who offended them. Most of us have grown up with, these, with the uh, little childhood rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. It's now become names are microaggressions and their violence against me. It's become violent to offend someone. And we, we haven't heard these terminologies much in Australia yet, but in America, in Canada, in England, and soon in Australia, those are the sort of things that will be written into law that you and I will have to try and grapple with and understand. So here is what gender theory is today, and just so I can help you understand what it is, so you're not hearing terminologies on news and in, in reports and trying to figure out what is it, well, I don't understand this, so let me try and take you on this journey. Gender theory basically says this, that gender is essentially performative. Gender is not something you are, it is something you do. So gender is not something that you are, it is something that you do. It's a behavior. And what that means is there is a spectrum, as you just saw on the intro video there. On one side is the male uh, part of the gender. On the other extreme is the female gender. And then in between these two binary genders are these spectrum of genders. No one knows how many there are in this non-binary collective. And no one knows what they're called yet because it's all based on, remember, individual. What the individual feels they are, that's what they are. And so because of that, we have these different, these different expressions. So, um, for instance, each one of these can have a pronoun. A pronoun means the name that you would like to be referred refer to. The, the, the English language Instead of a he or she, how do I refer to you without saying your name every time? I can't say he, it has to be something. So is the, the ones we just said a moment ago were things like zer, z, they're the common ones that are being used at the moment. They, them, zim, viz, ver, m, and per self, and many, many more. Now these are the ones that are commonly used. This is unending, 
There is no, there is no limitation. It all depends on the individual's expression of their gender and what they believe their gender is and ha- what pronoun they would like to create in order for the world to refer to them as. So what happens is, the big four things that, that we just saw in the news report, and by the way, that, that news report that was in the intro was only from April the 17th of this year. So that wasn't 10 years ago, that was, that was last week. And, um, and it was from Mitchelton High School down here in Queensland. And they're teaching this, the, the gingerbread, the ginger, gender bread person to the children, to the primary age kids right now. So in schools right now, that's what they're teaching the kids. Which means kids come home and they're confused with, as parents are reporting, with dad, you told me I'm a boy, but I may not be a boy. So these are the things that we're dealing with in our, in our young kids. So the big four, the gender, sex, attraction, and expression are the four things that may make up who you are. So your gender and sex, the way you express yourself, uh, and who you are attracted to, all make up who you are uh, as a person. But none of these are binary and none of them are normal. Not one of them is normal only, and not one of them is binary. So what that means is, and I'll explain these terms a little, a little bit slower, is that on the spectrum, each one of those things, your gender, your sex, your attraction, and your expression can be all on a spectrum. So you may not be male, female. You may be something else in, in between those things. You may not be attracted to the opposite sex or the same sex. You may be attracted to both or different or v- different versions of that because if you have one person on a spectrum and the other person is on the spectrum, then you can't say that's a male and this is a female, that's a male and that's a male. It's, it's various spectrums. So you can see the plethora of options that opens up our society in how to understand this scenario. If you haven't signed up for Facebook yet and you go to Facebook to sign up uh, this week, you will find that there are 71 gender options on Facebook when you sign up at the moment. You scroll down, there are 71. There are 71 options that Facebook have got uh, now. That was only 36, only a couple of months ago. A few months ago, now it's up to 71. and, And I would not be surprised if it gets in the hundreds in the next 12 to 18 months because that's how quickly they're being developed. A doctor, Elizabeth Taylor from the RMIT University uh, in Melbourne, she went through and presented something only a few weeks ago that I thought was really important for me to be able to talk to you about in regards to what these programs are doing to or telling our kids, which is a great way for us. It's not something that we're making up. It's not something that Christians are, uh, are shaking the cage about and getting upset about. This is from the Safe Schools program, which has now been replaced by the Respectful Relationships program. Known, known or billed or promoted as an anti-bullying program to our children when really they are absolutely everything but anti-bullying. As a matter of fact, some proponents have said that these programs are not only not anti-bullying, but they are actually a social re-engineering of our children. Some have said that they go towards a more of a Marxist approach. And, and for many young people here today, um, especially if you're in university, you can be, you can be forgiven in uh, being, being jammed down your throat and therefore believing that socialism and communism and Marxist um, the, uh, theoretical politics is amazing. I would invite you to buy a ticket to Venezuela and go live there for six months and then tell me if you believe communism is amazing. And the reason why I say that is because in Venezuela, they are utilizing communism um, a lot more than it's been utilized in most of the world in recent history. And so you can go there, you can read up, I'm not going to go into the detail, but you can read up about what's happening there, and uh, you'll see the realities of what, so, what communism is doing. Now, I understand the heart behind why some young people want socialism, because the ideology is that socialism is about caring for the poor, that everyone should be equal, that people should be looked after, that everyone should have the same abilities or the same opportunities. And all of those things is exactly what all of us want in democracy. Except in order to get those results by the government, you have to give up all of your freedoms in order to do that. That's why communism doesn't work. That's why socialism doesn't work. The amount of freedom you have to give up in order to obtain these, uh, the word is equality of outcome as opposed to equality of opportunity. 
In order to get equality of outcome, you would have to give up an enormous amount of freedoms to be able to do that. So you can't earn more than a certain amount. You'll be taxed more than everyone else. Uh, You can't live in a certain place until the government says you can. You can't do certain things until the government says you can because you cannot be richer than your neighbor is effectively how it works. Now, those two particular ideologies, uh, equality of outcome and equality of opportunity, they're the two different dangers that most of us can easily hear and then let it slip away. An equality of opportunity you all agree with. We agree, and all of us want to live in a nation where everyone can have the same opportunity to get ahead in life. We all have the same opportunity to get the same medical treatment. We all have the same opportunity or thereabouts to get uh, uh, the, op- the, the ability to move forward and get education and be able to build a life for ourselves and our families. All of us want that. No one, in, in, and, I, and I would say as a Christian, no one would want anyone else to suffer. We all want the poor to be looked after. We all want those who are less fortunate ourselves to be loved, to be given a hand up, to be given a, a, a place to move forward. None of that should, be, should not be done. All of it should be done. But if we say an, a, 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 that's, a, that's a, a, an equality of opportunity, but if we want to get an equality of outcome, which means we believe that everyone should have the same outcome in life, just think about that for a minute. Think about that. That means if you're a business person who's got a very successful business, and I'm a business person who has a very unsuccessful business, you need to give me your business success just because we should have the equality of outcome. The outcomes in our business trading should be the same. How do you achieve that? How do you achieve that without robbing Peter to pay Paul? And so we need to be very careful with that, young people especially, who have, um, and I say young people because the older people have seen the effects of uh, have seen the effects of socialism and communism through nations that, that were so that way up until recent history. But Dr. Elizabeth Taylor says this, that you can be attracted, this is the, from the Safe Schools program, you can be attracted to anyone on the whole spectrum because your feelings and your behavior are independent of each other. Your feelings and your behavior are independent of each other. Man, because of the spectrum, because there is a spectrum, she says that most people are on the spectrum, but the reason why they don't deviate from being male or female is because of the judo-christian worldview that's oppressed or suppressed those movements into that spectrum it's up to the individual to decide their gender sex is only a tool that you are born with on the outside but gender is a feeling that you have on the inside So right now, when our kids are getting the gender-bred person ideology taught to them, what they're being taught is that exactly. The genitalia you have, or the eggplant and the flower, as we just saw, thank you for the biology lesson, the genitalia you have doesn't determine who you are. That's the tool you use to, for your sexual attraction, but, but what you feel like tells you what gender you are. That can change. So a non-conforming gender person can change every day, every moment, at any time that they wish to do so, theoretically. How you dress, therefore, and your expression and your hair and your your behavior can change as well whenever you want it to. It is believed that gender is assigned to you at birth, listen to this, because of a predetermined social construct. So, So what the ideology that's coming out now and universities being about teaching these so much so is that is that the doctor picks you up when you're born, looks between your legs, and declares the gender of the child based on their sexual organs. They're saying that is therefore a very repressive way of putting a social construct on this young person. The young person should be left to decide their gender. This is the ideology that's happening at the moment that's, that I believe is very dangerous and many others do. It's not just a thing that, that I believe. What they fail to say at this stage in these safe schools and respectful relationships programs is that, um, that there is a lot more than just genitalia at work here. There are hormones and chromosomes that, that tell you what gender you are, a lot more than what you see. Here is a quote from the book itself, uh, from, the, from the teachings. It says, as a newborn, your child's possibilities are limitless. We agree with this. The world is full of possibilities that every person deserves to be able to explore freely. We agree with this. With infant gender assignment, i.e. doctor picks it up, looks at the genitals. With infant gender assignment, 
in a single moment, your baby's life has been instantly and brutally reduced from such infinite potential down to one concrete set of expectations and stereotypes. This ideology that I just read then is why there are many parents now, many more than you and I know, now call their children uh, non-binary names, non-gender specific names. Tony with an I, Peter with an A. Uh, give them a name that is non-gender specific and, uh, and put them in clothes that are non, non-stereotypical colors in order to allow the child at some stage at three, four or five to decide what their gender is. I don't know if you see an issue with that child's psychological development. I certainly do. Uh, in, and, I, and I humbly say that in my non-psychological uh, degree. But after speaking to thousands of people over 24 years, there are basically four or five things that people have got that, that are the basis of most people's issues about their life. One of them is identity. That's after thousands of people that I've met with and counseled. Thousands. I don't need a degree to understand human behavior and to see that our problems, most of us are like the rest of us. Love, acceptance, uh, belonging, identity are some of the key ones that cause the issues that we have. And if we're stripping away identity from the kids, I I hate to see what's going to happen over the next 10, 15 years, which is why we as disciples of Jesus Christ need to be armed and ready to love, to accept, to help, to speak truth, to lead people into the ways of Jesus Christ. Some people say to me, uh, as Pastor, uh, as Shane Willard spoke today, but you know that the world's going, the world's going to hell. It's getting worse. Actually, no, the world's okay. World's doing great, right? What we've got to do is, if the world is getting darker, then your light should shine brighter. Our light should shine brighter if the world's getting darker. If if people are becoming more confused about their identity, we have something uh, in our worldview called Jesus Christ who will give you your absolute identity and help you with that. And so we need to shine the brightest. This is not time to recoil. This is not time to step back. This is a time to understand and move forward, to be the voice that people need to hear. Because in reality, what's happening is there is a crisis embarking on our young people a crisis about to happen in their identity. This is not just an infant thing and we're going to deal with in 20 years. Our university students are being bombarded by people who have this ideology at their core. Some of them are militant and want that, that very social, um, socialistic Marxist type thinking and, and push that into our young people. But even if they're soft version of that, even if they're just thinking, look, yeah, you can be any gender you want and you should be okay with that. And here are all the reasons why. What will that young person, that 18, 19, 20, 22-year-old, what are they going to think when they get into the workforce, when they're, when they're now doing psychology, when they're teaching people this ideology? It just perpetuates. So we need to be prepared. There's a new word that's just recently been, uh, been concocted called heteronormativity. Some of you may have never heard of that word before. Heteronormativity apparently is everything that you suffer with. You may not have known that. Heteronormativity says this. It is the belief that there is a boy, that boys, sorry, have a male body and girls have a female body and that heterosexual attraction is normal. If you believe that boys have a male body and girls have a female body and heterosexual attraction is normal, you suffer from this thing called heteronormativity. I know it's funny. I know, I know. It's like when I first read it, it's funny. But then I started to see how it's being used by by the psychologists and the professors of our current universities and current thought tanks, and it, I stopped laughing because it's being used like a hammer. It's being used as a neg- negative word. It's being used as you are now a bigot and, and intolerant if you are heteronormative. So the reason is heteronormativity, therefore, if you believe that, excludes everyone else apparently, and therefore it's inherently oppressive and discriminatory. Because if you believe that, het- that heterosexuality is normal, then any other transsexuality, homosexuality, pansexuality, uh, any of the other sexualities are less than normal and therefore you are treating them as such. Even though you haven't done that, you have, your actions don't show that. We are now delving into ideas of, of what you know, George Orwell wrote in his book 1984 called The Thought Police or Thought Crimes. 
and, uh, and some are, shake, are nodding your head because you've read the book, and uh, we're there now. So now you can have, now you can, um, um, we're getting close to that your words uh, or thoughts or beliefs can be violent towards someone else. This is why we need to be ready. Therefore, many minorities believe that the only way to eradicate discrimination against the old LGBT community uh, is to socially re-engineer society and the norms and the expressions and the definitions. If heteronormativity is the problem, then that needs to go. That needs to be re-engineered. That's the basis of what's happening. That's the basis of what's happening, and that is dangerous. Now, we may not be able to change society. This is what we have to understand as Christians. We may not be able to change that wave. We may not be able to, to dispel that wave. We can pray. We can be ready. But what we can do is shine the light into that darkness. We, we'll, do, we'll do whatever we can. We can, you, can you can be an activist. You can, you can, you can go and, and, and fill out forms. You can do all those things that, that are what's afforded to us in our, in our um, current democratic society. And it's amazing that we live in a nation that allows us to have a voice. So please have a voice whenever the opportunity comes up. But even if the tide turns and it goes a particular way, there's something that can never be taken away from you. And that is what you believe. That is the Spirit of God in you. That is your ability to have a voice, to be able to love and care without agreeing with people, but still loving and caring for them, which I'll touch on again. Inclusion, therefore, requires not just acceptance of someone, but the normalization of their beliefs or their, or their uh, feelings. So it's not just inclusion anymore. It's gone from including or being inclusive to now being normal. If you don't feel it's normal, then you're the, you're the bigot. So therefore, as we carry on, remember the spectrum I just showed a moment ago? What is normal for one person in that community has to be normal for everyone. And anytime someone rises up and says, this is normal for me, then it has to be normal for everyone. That's the only way we can re-engineer society and move forward. So if heteronormativity, and this is the final step in, in this scenario, some people may disagree with this, but if heteronormativity is, a, is an oppressive thought of the Judeo, uh, Judeo-Christian worldview, then on, the only way to get rid of heteronormativity is to dispel with the Judeo-Christian worldview. Phobia. <laughs> Phobia used to mean an irrational fear, listen to this, an irrational fear leading to illogical behaviors. So an irrational fear leading to an illogical behavior. That is important. Notice what I said there. A fear leading to a behavior. Not just a fear, but it leads to a behavior. And that behavior either hurts yourself or hurts someone else. Now it doesn't mean that anymore. Homophobia now means that you think heterosexuality is normal, so therefore you're homophobic. And transphobia now means that you disagree with the gender theory that I've just been talking about. Therefore, you are transphobic. It's not that you've attacked the transgender person. It's not that you've, you've, you've done something to them. It is the fact that you believe something different. Therefore, you are attacking them. That's the parts that we need to be very wary of. In a support guide that's been written, uh, released by Harvard University only a few months ago, it says, transphobic misinformation which means, if you don't agree with the gender theory, transphobic misinformation is now a form of violence. This is written into the university support God. Just by thinking differently, you are hurting people. So this, these are the things that are happening in our universities right now. Disagreement has become synonymous with discrimination. Choosing not to call someone by their preferred pronoun can be seen as a form of microaggression. Microaggression is a new buzzword that's just come out, which means it's not a full aggression, it's a microaggression. So I feel like you've been aggressive towards me, but not fully aggressive by yelling and screaming at me, but you've decided not to believe what I believe, so that's a microaggression. And because I feel like you're having a microaggression against me, I need to go find a safe place. There are actually safe spaces in universities around the world, now in our Western world, uh, where, where safe spaces have to be there, where there are no judgment given, um, and, no, and, and anyone can be whatever they want to be in that space. You may have seen on news that when people come to speak, even just in universities, which used to be a, a, a 
bastion of the ability to come and have differing thoughts and, and to be able to wrestle with those thoughts and, and debates and arguments on, based on intellectual or scientific reasoning. To be able to, to do that in universities is now being squashed to, no, if you don't believe what we believe, we don't want you here. That is dangerous because if we can't think as mankind and if we can't express those thoughts and, and have debate about particular issues, then we are heading towards a scenario where there is dictatorship and tyranny. That's the only way it goes. Everyone here has to start. Now, the, I, I don't want to have fear mongering. I'm, I'm not talking about what's going to happen in 10 years time, 20 years time. I don't know. I don't know what God's going to do. I don't know how it's going to work. All I do know is that this is happening now. And we need to be prepared for it on how to give loving and caring answers without folding. The reason why I saw many, many families fold at the same-sex marriage debate, what I mean by fold is uh, up until something had personally affected them, they believed that the, the pattern for humanity was that marriage was between one man and one woman until death didn't part. And so, so they believed that that was the pattern for marriage that God had done for family because family is the, is the, social, is the, is the main construct of, of society. Without a strong family basis, society cannot live. And so they believed that through the biblical worldview, but as soon as, as soon as a family member came out to say they were gay or as soon as they got some pressure because of a, a friend or a close loved one who said, I just want to be able to marry the one I love, and I understand those feelings. For those that don't know, I, I am one of four siblings, myself, my two sisters, and my brother. Both my sisters are gay. Both are in partnerships. One of them has a child to her partner. Now, funnily enough, they call them Christian, which is even better. I said to her, do you know what Christian means, right? She says, what? I said, it means like Jesus. Excellent. Keep calling him that. That's brilliant. And so, so I understand how to walk through this on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not speaking pie-in-the-sky stuff. I'm speaking the ability to walk through loving my family while I disagreed wholeheartedly with the lifestyle choice, with their choices, and with same-sex marriage. And so... And so I've never got it through these personally. But what has happened to many, to, not many, but to some, to some families is, is they get the Word of God and then they, instead of seeing life through the Word, they then put the Word beneath life and they see the Word through life and say, well, maybe God didn't mean it that way. Maybe God didn't really, so surely our loving God won't, didn't mean one man, one woman. Surely He didn't mean that. Surely He just meant people who love each other. But no, it is like that. And so the reason why there's a folding of that is because people start to look at, people start to look at it and go, well, well, God loves, so, so yes, but God loves, but there's still parameters. God loves people. So I, I know that I'm not going to talk, about, like I said, 10 years from now and fear mongering, but what I do want to say is that right now you're going to meet people next week, next year, in five years' time, who are going through the, the gender identity issue. How do I love them? How do I speak to them? How do I, I can't just ignore people like this. You realize that these people who are battling with gender identity issues are going to be coming to our church. They're going to be coming to churches all around Australia. And you know what? I really hope they feel like they can. I really hope they feel like they can. Sometimes we want to do things that the Holy Spirit's job to do. Our job is to love and care have an answer for, lead them in the right way, let the Holy Spirit do the rest, because that's what He's good at doing. And so, so this misinformation, this microaggression that we're dealing with at the moment, so, so what now? What do I do? How, how, do I, how do I do this? Because in Canada and in America, it's, it's starting to become compelled speech. So, so I, 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 can, I, can, I can teach you, Mick, in Canada, that you can't say certain words, and there's certain words that you can say. This is what Jordan Peterson had an issue with, um, when he, a Canadian guy, when it was when Bill C-16 was being introduced, he had the issue that oh, look, I, I don't, I don't mind calling a transgender person by their pr pronoun. If they came to me and respectfully asked, look, my, my pronoun is Zim. Can you please call me that when you're referring to me? Uh, he said, I have no issue with doing that. What I have an issue with is when the government forces me to do that, because that's taking away free speech. That's taking away someone's ability to choose whether I want to or not. That's what I mean by this is not about kindness. You can give kindness one-to-one. -one. I can give kindness from me to you. But if you force me to give you kindness, that's no longer kindness. 
False kindness is not kindness. That's a duress. That's not kindness. That's me submitting to a big stick. We know that forced love is not love. Forced kindness isn't. Kindness, things like the, the, the metaphysical um, ideas of kindness and love and compassion and care all have to be tied to the absolute truth of love. Oh, free choice, free will, sorry, the absolute truth of free choice. If, you, if I don't have the free choice to love and to care and to be kind and compassionate, then none of them exist outside of free will. This is, why, this is why God gave us free will, actually. That was the main reason, to be able to do those things on our own volition. So where to from now? We, we all want to live in a world where, where there is compassion for the vulnerable. I don't think there's anyone in this room who doesn't want compassion for the vulnerable or an affirmation for all human dignity for everyone. We should all celebrate and protect programs that, are, that uh, elevate these noble causes. We, we should do that, but not just by looking at the title. When the word safe schools came out, it sounded like, oh yeah, we want to stop anti-bullying. Yeah, we don't want anyone to be bullied. I agree with that. No one here condones bullying. I, 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 I would be shocked if someone said, you know what? Sometimes bullying is good. And if you felt that way, I really hope that you don't feel that way once you read the Bible, especially Jesus' words. No one condones uh, bullying or name calling or mistreatment of any human being. If a, dis- if a Christian honestly is not disgusted by these actions, then they really need to go figure out the basic tenets of Christianity before they go, go out and call themselves a Christian. They really need to, to, to do that. And so it's important to know what Christianity is about. Uh, Jesus taught these things. He taught acceptance and compassion and love and peace, embrace. But Jesus was also a master of teaching truth and provo- um, leading people to a solution. That's what he did. He didn't force anyone there. But hey, I, I, know, I know you think this way right now and I know you feel this way right now, but why don't you follow me, follow me and let me show you what you're really designed to be like. Hey, why don't you follow me and, and but I don't want to, God, I find it hard. No worries. Okay, cool. I'm over there when you need me. That was Jesus' approach. I, I love you. I care for you, but I'm not going to agree with you. When, when my sister decided to tell uh, me that, that she was gay or one of them, um, she thought as Christians and as pastors, we would be the ones that would, that would uh, shun them and reject them the most. She literally said those words. I know, George, that you're going to be really upset about it, and I know that you're not going to understand, and I know that you're going to want to try and change us. And so uh, if you don't want to talk to me ever again, I understand. <laughs> what? So I rang her up and said, so what are, you, what are you talking about? That's not what I want. That's not who I am. That's the total opposite of the one that I'm following called Jesus Christ. I don't agree with you. You know this. I don't have to tell you that. I don't agree with homosexuality being a, is the way that God designed us. But if that's what you feel that you are, that's okay with me. I love you and I will care for you. It's not my job to change you. My job is to just show you the love of God whenever I can. And she said, okay, okay. I don't think she believed what I was saying. She just said, okay. But it wasn't until a few years later, a couple of years later, where she literally sent me a text message saying, George, out of all of the family that have said they've accepted us, you and Heather are the only ones that have constantly contacted us and showed us real love and acceptance when we thought you were going to be the ones that will reject us the most. Thank you so much. Then, then the child was coming. So I got another letter that said the exact same thing. Here is the child, and we, don't, we know if you don't want your children to have anything to do with this child that's coming. And I said, uh, once again, this time I thought, okay, I'll, ring, I'll write a letter back. I said, okay, here's a letter. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you think, who you think I am or what you think Christianity is. It's really sad that she thought that about Christianity. But then I, I said, but we will love this child like he is a blood nephew of ours, uh, and we will be with him, and every time we're there, we want to hang out with him, and we do. And, that, and we FaceTime and we talk. Why? Why? In her mind, why would you do that? Because I love you. Because I care for you. Now, no doubt we had to go through our own stuff to work out. Okay, what do we do here? How do we, you know, driving to Sydney one day, Dave, my good friend Dave, driving to Sydney one day, uh, we have to tell our children, seven and five and and nine, hey, um, let me explain homosexuality to you. And let me explain why your auntie who doesn't have a husband has got a child. And so we had to go through those things and we talked through them with them. But I want to be able to teach my children in the ways of God, not just go too hard a discussion, leave it. 
Now, my children are all are growing up, all grown up. Most of them are teenagers. <laughs> Pray for me. Well, um, a couple of them are older. And so, and, so, and so they are very accepting and loving of people, but they know the difference between what the Bible says and what life is out there. They know the difference, but they still love and accept. That was a hard discussion to walk through. That was a hard time to get through with 100 questions, but it was worth it because we taught them how to be like Jesus. And I encourage you to do the same. So our, tenement, our tenants of Christianity are to love and accept, so we need to be that. So regardless of what the, the programs say, regardless of what happens, we need to be compassionate towards gender identity dysphoria, uh, which is what it's known as gender dysphoria. The, the pain that people feel when they feel like their gender on the inside is different to their biological sex. Here's what the Bible says. Amongst the many other things, here's what the Bible says. In Genesis 1.27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. This is the, this is the first. This is the, the first time the Bible talks about gender difference. The first time, and, and all of the gender uh, um, references in the Bible are based off this one scripture. That God created man, male and female. There are two sets of genders, only two. He, notice it didn't say he created a multiple plethora of genders, but we're only going to talk about male and female because I, you know, Moses is saying, I can't write them all down, I'm, oh, my hand's killing me, right? He didn't say that. He said there are two genders. And everything that comes with those genders. Men and women are different at the deepest levels. Our chromosomes are different, our brains are different, our voices are different, our body shapes are different, our body strengths are different, our rep reproductive systems are different. We are designed in our bodies because we're destined to be different. We're not the same. We, we, we can't have philosophically, you can't have, it's philosophically impossible to have a man who can become physically a woman and a woman who can become physically a man. I know there's gender reassignment that happens and surgical reassignment, but the chromosomes don't change nor do the hormones change. No, these things are, are, are extremely important. The, gender is not a social construct, guys. Gender is not something that was given because some person or some group of people thousands of years ago decided, you know what, from now on, every time a baby's born, if they have a penis, it's a, we'll call it a boy. If they have a vagina, we'll call it a girl. That's all, that's it. Let everyone else be quiet. Let's move on with, with, with life. It's not a social construct. This is all based on the way we were designed. There are chromosomes that speak to that. There are hormones that speak to that. There are sexual organs that speak to that. This is not a, a societal norm. This is not something that, that is just there. It, gender is really binary. But there are people who do have feelings that they're not the gender that they are born with, the sex that they were born with. And so we need to be able to speak love to them. Now, we may not have the answers. We might have a question tonight and today, and you'll, sometimes there isn't an answer to why people feel this way. Sometimes there is an answer. But we need to ask the question. We need, to be, we need people to be able to, to have uh, uh, love that goes with even a non-answer. And finally, one of the final things I want to say before I, before I get Jared and back up here is, Jordan Peterson was asked one time, again, another great proponent of, of talking about this topic, in a news report, he was asked in an interview, why should your right to freedom of speech trump a trans person's right to not be offended? Pretty good question, especially in light of this society. He said, because in order to be able to think, you have to be able to risk being offensive. In order to be able to think, you have to risk being offensive. Not that you want to be, but if I say something that's different to what you believe and you believe that's offensive, then that's something you have to walk through. I thoroughly believe that what we started as a society 15 to 20 years ago, where, where teachers were told not to, not to use red pens, don't say the word no, don't, have, don't, don't keep score in, um, in sporting fields, don't, don't teach children how to deal with disappointment or rejection, don't teach kids on how to, how to have the ability to wait for what they want to get in life rather than I need it instantly right now. That has led us to a place where people don't know how to deal with different thinking or rejection or the ability to get offended. Resilience in our children has become so minimal that if someone says something, our suicide rate skyrockets. That, is, that saddens me as a human being, let alone as a Christian and as a pastor, that people, we've got the answer to, that, that is Jesus Christ 
to give them a purpose and a plan for their life, yet the only answer they feel they have is to, I need to go and take my own life, or I need to go and question everything that I've ever known. Kindness is paramount. What I would like to see happen in schools instead of compelled speech laws in our society, but is kindness and respect classes. Kindness and respect classes, the ability to teach people on how to respect others and be kind to them, even though I don't understand what you're going through. As a Christian, there is definitely a new world that's emerging in front of us, a world that we may find hard to understand. Some of us, and I hope not many here today, will choose not to want to understand it and stand against it um, in a bad way. But irrespective of how hard it may become, our role is to be like Jesus. Our role is to be like Jesus. Our role is to not not only be like Jesus when everything is going well and everyone goes to Sunday school, but our role is to be like Jesus in the darkest of times, to be the greatest shining light that we can be. The ability to be able to love without agreeing is going to be an enormous skill to have as a disciple of Jesus. Listen to what I said. Not, not tolerant, but the ability to love without agreeing. That's very different to tolerance. You can look up the word tolerance and what it means. But Jesus was not tolerant. Jesus loved without agreeing with someone. That is a huge thing that we need to learn. I know that being like Jesus isn't easy sometimes, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, it is very powerful to be like Jesus. It's not easy, but it's very powerful with the power of the Holy Spirit to be like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Thank you, guys. Jeridan, come and take us away as we get into Q&A. Thanks, mate. Awesome. Thank you, George. The ability, ability to love without agreeing, that's a skill. That's something that we can practice every day. You know, we were talking about gender and sex, but we were talking about a whole bunch of other stuff too. Communism, Marxism, it's a big thing. But what George said there is you can bring it down to, to one point, it's to be like Jesus. How do we be like Jesus in a situation? And Jesus uh, is truth. Jesus is love. So in order for me to bring truth and love into a situation, all I have to do is, is bring Jesus into that situation. Amen. Anyway, tonight we are going on to our Q&A uh, part of the night. The Q&A process is uh, to text your questions to the number behind me, which is 0487 003978. Send your questions to that number. Um, it'll, it will be anonymous. We, we, we won't know who's sending the questions. Send, that, uh, send your questions to that number. Please keep the questions on topic, and we'll try to answer those questions as best as we can. Like George said at the beginning, uh, we will, if we don't get to your question, we'll attempt to answer your question, send a text back to you sometime throughout the week. I know there were a couple question that, questions that didn't get answered last week, but um, we've been trying to get to them throughout the week. So let's uh, get our panel out here. It's my pleasure to introduce our panel for tonight. He is the senior pastor at Worship Center, runs a successful business, and is a life coach to an Olympic athlete. Please welcome George Saloom. <laughs> Trained as a counselor with incredible insight into the human heart and behavior, her, her unique ability to get the, to the core of a person whilst showing them love, compassion, and care is second to none. She has counseled and sat with countless people through all seasons of life. Please welcome Shruti Hutchison. A Christian activist, architect of the Church and State Summit and host of the online, online talk show, uh, Palo Talk. Please welcome Dave Palo. And she's studying a Bachelor of Laws and Bachelor of Government at, and International Relations at Griffith University. Please welcome Anne Marina Smith. Fantastic. So, again, once again, the uh, process for the Q&A is simply to... Text your questions to the number that's on the screen, uh, and we'll try to get to those questions uh, throughout the Q&A. Let me just get set up here. One moment. All right, so to kick us off tonight, uh, let's get this, this first question underway. First question is, what determines masculinity and femininity, culture or an objective standard, or neither? Let's, uh, let's go to George for that one. <laughs> <laughs> always, always first. What determines masculinity and femininity? Look, I, I think as a, as a Christian, uh, that's determined by the Word of God. Um, I, I won't go to the fact that it's observational at the moment, 
um, or, or sorry, observable, uh, but our masculinity and femininity is determined by really uh, who God is. So when God created man in the scripture I just read a moment ago, God created man male and female. And so it is, it is believed by some scholars that when God created Adam, he had female and male attributes in him and so um, and character, characteristics. And so when God realized, or when, when God allowed Adam to realize that out of all of the creation of animals, no one was comparable to him, he put him to sleep, pulled the female attributes out of him. And so that was where we got the masculinity and femininity. Now, um, in regards to uh, certain characteristics, like, um, you know, guys take bins out and girls do dishes, that's a, that's a social norm that's been put on, you know, and, and it's different in every, in every culture. Every culture is different. So none of those things determine femininity or masculinity, like those sort of jobs. But I think inherently uh, there, is, there, there is a feminine and masculine thing. Like, for instance, Jordan Peters, Peterson obviously um, quite constantly quotes that um, even in societies where there is absolute freedom of gender expression, like in, the, in Scandinavia, you know, throughout uh, Sweden and Holland and Denmark, uh, absolutely there are no ties. Are we, we're actually, you know, in comparison, probably 100 years behind, you know, where they are at the moment. They're so free that there are preschools designed for, pe- for kids who are non-binary, like the preschools specifically for them. Um, they still find that women take more of the humanitarian roles in society, nursing, caring, um, those sort of things, and more men, percentage, 70s and 80%, go into engineering and building and construction. Uh, and so, so they're finding that even in those free societies where there is no social construct, so to speak, that, that men are built differently to women. And so there is that inherent uh, God-given difference between masculine and feminine. Very good. So just to, uh, on that, I've got, I've got a question, follow-up question. As a kid, you know, being introduced to, uh, to guys wearing skinny jeans, uh, I was made of questions. I was made of questions. So in terms of like, let's say, talk about uh, cross-dressing is a big thing. Where I am, I'm from the Philippines. There's many, many people who uh, may be male who dress like a female. So cross-dressing, masculinity, femininity, wh- where are the lines on that? To George. You again, girls, help me out. Got I me, mean, girls, guys, help me out, guys and girls. See that? Um, oh, look, I, again, I think clothing, clothing is a is a um, is a social expression. I've seen I've seen fashions now starting to change to where guys are wearing suits that look like a cool dress, like you know, like a skirt, you know, um, and uh, you know, uh, it's an expression of what people want. Now, no doubt, we see that as a norm that guys wear pants, girls wear dresses. Guys, you know, guys shouldn't wear skinny jeans. Now, I, where's the line drawn? Um, that's really up to <laughs> you. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think we can get hung up on those things. Um, I won't wear a dress because no one needs to see my legs, okay? Um, and, uh, but wh- where do you go? These, these, are the, these are the norms. Now, but he, I'm sort of joking a little bit, but here's, here's the importance of it. In our society, we can ascertain someone's gender by the expression that they give. So the way they do their hair, the way they, the way they express themselves in their behavior and the way they dress will help me understand that, that this human being is a boy, so I can say he. Usually, Usually right? Yeah. And so, so now that's becoming eradicated where I can't look at this human being and say, uh, he would like a drink of water. No, no, don't call me he. I'm a Zim. I don't know what, you know, I don't know what that means now. So, so that's the importance, I think. Uh, that's actually going to become more important in expression. And we're all going to get confused. We're, that's what's going to happen is, is Shruti might rock up one day and she's wearing sort of a, you know, a female blouse, you know, a, a, a female blouse but soccer shorts and, um, you know, half a head shaven. I don't know, Shruti. Your husband's not liking that, that picture at all. But this is what we're dealing with, and we don't know how to interact with that, so that's going to become a lot more confusing. Mm. Yeah. Would you like to add to that, or anyone on the panel? Yeah, look, uh, to answer your question, cross-dressing, um, a few thousand years ago, the Romans were invading the United Kingdom, and they went from the south through to the north, and then they came to Hadrian's Wall, which is basically the border of Scotland in those days. 
and they saw a whole bunch of girls with, you know, huge muscular arms and big <laughs> hairy faces and they, you know, history shows they didn't go any further because they basically said, man, if that's their women, we don't want to see their men. <laughs> which, which a Scot told me that joke, so it's, you know, I don't know <laughs> if that's okay, but um, clearly in some cultures, you know, it's okay to wear a skirt. Um, and they're very, very masculine um, when they do so. Um, in, in some of the Pacific Island cultures, you know, it's very masculine again. I wish I could pull it off. Wrong culture. Um, so the answer to that question is yes. Um, culture and an objective standard. There, there are different, different um, times where it is purely cultural, and yet there are objectively masculine behaviours. Great. So, moving on to the next question. I believe this is directed at Shruti. She is the counsellor on the panel. How would you speak to someone who comes to you as a counsellor about gender identity issues? So, take us through that process. Someone comes to you, they've gone through some, you know, their identity issues uh, to do with gender. What's the process that you take them on? Um, I spend the first few sessions with them really listening to them. Um, I really want to get down to what their heart is saying, what their mind is saying, what are their feelings saying. I really want to know what is under the surface of whatever they're wearing, however they're looking, um, you know, the way they're presenting themselves to me. I'm actually, I have no interest in that at this point. I really want to know who you are. I really want to know where this journey began. Um, I really Personally, I really believe in the sowing and reaping. I have children of my own, and seven, six, and four, and I know when they respond to me, it is coming from a place of what we have sown into them. And so I wanna know who has sown into you from the start? Yeah. Who has been talking to you? Who have you been listening to? What have you been listening to? And I really want to, so while they're talking, I'm spending a lot of time observing, listening, body language, words that they're using, people that they talk about. Um, and that says a lot when you spend time with someone, uh, the person that keeps coming up over and over again, you start to recognize things. And so the first few sessions, I really just want them to know, I just want to hear you. Yeah. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to hear your story. It matters. Your journey matters, and um, and we'll 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 go from there. And it's it's a lot of um, them feeling really comfortable to just be themselves, mm. so they can actually give me what's going on on the inside. Mm. So so when you hear hearing these stories, is there any is there a common thread that you tend to hear th uh, from story to story when people are just expressing themselves, telling you what they've been through, their experiences? Is there like a common thread that you notice? Is it something to do with their childhood, perhaps, or is it something to do with the, the style of parenting that they went through? Is, is, is there a common thread that you can sort of identify through these, from, from case to case um, about gender identity? Um, I have been in this field for only three years, and in that three years, I personally have recognised a lot of it comes down to what's been going on in the household from the time we were, they were really little. You know, there's a hierarchy from two to four, certain things get consolidated in a child's, you know, inside, and then four to, and it goes on. And so it's very crucial in those beginning stages to see what has been going on in their household, what has been, you know, who has been saying what, what has been sown into them, because these seeds will produce fruit. There's good fruit, there's bad fruit. So I really want to know what those seeds are. I can see the fruit. I want to know what those seeds are. I guess it just puts a bit more context around. I know the plebiscite is over and it's, it's done, but it puts more context around the importance of marriage and how the family is designed. As you said, it, it starts in the household, and if you have, the, if the design is wrong from the get-go, how is that? How is that equal opportunity? How is that a good opportunity for someone to be put into that situation? Anyway, moving on to our next question: um, Why would the government forced me to say a certain pronoun. So let's go to Dave for the, on, on that one. Why would, the, why would the government, what's what's the government strategy in doing that? Why would they force me to say a certain pronoun? Uh, look, it, it's 
highly subjective. It's it's because I, I oh, there's so many ways to answer that. Um, the tyranny of democracy is probably one of the answers. Um, democracy isn't always good. Two lions and a goat voting on what to have for dinner. Bad outcome for the goat. You don't want to be in the minority in that vote. Um, you know, so just because it's democratic doesn't mean it's right. There's, I mean, you can look at history and we can all, even the people on the opposite political spectrum of us today, will be able to identify moments in history where the popular legal consensus was grossly immoral. And we can stand and condemn that today. But yet they'll turn around and say, oh, well, if it's popular today, if we got, you know, three out of five Australians saying that such and such a behaviour is normal, therefore it's normal. No, no. Popularity doesn't automatically mean it's right. So one of the answers is, is the tyranny of, of democracy. Um, you know, the weaponization of our legal system where we see that, that people are, are basically using our legal systems and our legislation to enforce their agenda where they can't win with democracy um, where they can't actually get things to, then, then they'll start, you know, claiming violence if you use the wrong, and, you know, the government has to look like it cares about violence, um, and, it, and it does, but so it then needs to say, oh, well, you being offended is a problem. We see that with our Racial Discrimination Act, you know, uh, to cause offence is actually illegal. Like, that's the tyranny of democracy. Um, not working very well for us in, in some expressions. Mm, there you go. Well, let's go to Amarina on, on this next question. Uh, how do we as Christians affirm traditional gender values in the academic public uh, policy realms? What secular source can we use to refute their claims? So um, we might go to a couple of people on the panel here, but mainly that first part of the question, Amarina, I know you're at university. You're a brilliant university student, not just in Brisbane, on the global stage, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but... Uh, how do we affirm Christian val uh, gender values in the ac academic and public policy realms? It's a very big question. <laughs> um, I think, first of all, having an understanding of what uh, um, we as Christians believe are traditional gender values, because I think, as George was speaking about, um, it is easy to get quite confused, because even um, growing up in a Christian household, you don't often hear some of these terms, you know, and if you go to a Christian school, it's often even more kind of, um, you're protected from that. So sometimes when you enter into circles like uh, university or even the workplace, um, those kinds of things, not having an understanding of even the terminology that people use um, it can be really difficult. So I think, first of all, getting that, getting your head around that um, and what, kind of the big issues are in that space. Um, then I guess just being willing to, to open up a conversation mm. with people um, and to, to be okay with disagreeing, even if it offends, and even if you do get labelled a bigot. Um, the number of times I've been labelled a bigot in university classes has well exceeded the hundreds by now. I'm in my fifth year. Um, and you kind of just have to grow a thick skin um, and go, you know what? This is what I believe, and I believe that people need to speak up for these things, um, and there needs to be someone willing to stand in that space. Um, and so, yeah, being really aware of that, and I guess having an understanding of the importance of that, and, and I guess relying on the Holy Spirit too to, to help you discern when to say something and when not to, because you don't always need to respond either in every situation. So. Yeah, I think that's such an important bit, and Dave actually mentioned it, uh, last week about the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit can partner with us in these situations and just, just speak to us, give us a guide on, on how, uh, how to engage in the conversation. Uh, do you want to answer that? I, I just wanted to um, just bounce off something that Am's just said then about being called a bigot. One of the things that, that I do as a practical thing, if someone calls me a bigot, um, which is never, never, never been called a bigot, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank you for getting that joke, yeah. Um, I found out what the word bigot meant, right? And so I was able to actually use that definition in defence. It's like um, the word bigot means to be intolerant of someone else's differing views. That's what you're doing right now. When you call me a bigot, you're, you're intolerant to my views. So I'm not the bigot. 
because I'm tolerant to your view. I'm happy with your views. I'm not telling you to shut up, you bigot, right? Uh, and so when you, when you arm yourself with information, you're able to be calm and not attack irrationally, okay? And that's like last week when we were talking about abortion and euthanasia. Sometimes we can attack people and tell them, you're going to hell if you, because we're not, we're not understanding the terminology and we don't know how to be able to give a, a reason thought, like it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, have a reason for your hope in Jesus Christ. So learn, understand, be knowledgeable of, of Christianity and the things of God. And that way you can just give. And then uh, like, like Shane said today, Shane Willer, and let's just take it on the chin. Yeah. It's okay to take it on the chin and move on. Yep. Yeah, fantastic. While you're on the mic, George, we'll go back to you on this next one. Um, how will we as a church accommodate transgenders as far as toilet facilities uh, are concerned so they feel comfortable? So take us oh. through what your plan is for our church. You, who lined that question up? <laughs> which one, which, which one of which you? One? You're in uh, trouble now. But, so take us through that, but also maybe take yes. us through big, big church, big C church yes. as a church entirely. How do we, how do we go through that? That's a, yeah, that, look, that is a big question. I, I don't know how to answer that yet, to be honest with you. I don't know what that's going to look like. Um, and that's the things I'm, I'm grappling with as a church leader, and I think most church leaders are grappling with. Like, for instance, when it came to the marriage debate, I came up with a solution of what will happen if a militant same-sex couple wanted to force the church to marry them and get the, 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 um, you know, get the law behind them to do that now, that now that's the case. Because it's not... Most same-sex couples know that a church doesn't want to believe in that and doesn't doesn't believe in that so they won't even approach that it's the half a percent of militant people that will get will get the church on the news right um and so you know we, we we've come to a decision where we won't do legal marriages we'll only do christian ceremonies right so what that means is what that means is when you go to a wedding there are two things actually happening uh, i know this doesn't answer the question but let me help you here um it does lead into it but two things actually happening there's a christian ceremony and the legal part at the end where you sign the document well, we won't do that. The couple can go and do that at births, deaths and marriages at any time. But before God, we believe you're married not when you sign the paper. We believe you're married once you made that commitment before the Lord and before witnesses and before, before a, a, a clergyman. So, or cler- yeah, and so before clergy. And so, um, so if that's the case, then let's take it back to that, what it was pre-1961, the Marriage Act, where you, you were considered married if the church in your local diocese signed you off as being married. So let's go back to that so that way we're not succumb to that. So in that same mentality, how do we help this? There's no doubt as a church we will have to face the reality of a man that looks like a man but dressed in really, you know, red lipstick and a dress decides to go into the woman's um, toilets. Uh, we have to address that as leaders and what we're going to do there. How do we do that? Um, do we have another set of bathrooms? They're the things we have to seriously look at. And so I can't give you a definitive yet, but that's definitely something we have to look at, yeah. Dave, you have something to add to that? Yeah. Um, at the Church and State Summit in February, I had a friend who is transgender fly up from Sydney to attend the, the conference. Um, and born a male, post-operative female now. Um, I think the answer is it's different in different scenarios. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll say he chose to... I saw him go into the women's toilet and I said nothing because it was inconsequential. It didn't really matter. There weren't lots of young kids there and I knew him and I thought he was safe. And I'm saying he now because we're in a public setting and, you know, there'll be a lot of value placed on the words that I choose. Personally, I've got you know, one-on-one, -on -one, like Dr. Jordan Peterson, um, I've got no problem being very sensitive about her feelings and, you know, talking to her the way she wants to be spoken to. If somebody came into that conference and wanted to make a demonstration out of it, wanted to make a case out of it, um, then, then it would become a political conversation. And, and this is something we need to, in this day and age, get um, discerning on is are we having a political conversation or are we having a personal conversation? And it could be one-on-one -on -one, or it could be in a, in a group and in a social context. So what kind of conversation are we having? Because in some contexts, we need to be incredibly sensitive and in other contexts, we need to be incredibly truthful. 
So if somebody's coming in to make a political statement and trying to, you know, make an example out of the church and force you to, to choose, you know, to stop them from using gendered toilets, then you pretty much have to pick the battle and say, okay, well, you know, if there was, you know, at the conference, if there was, a, if a mother came up to me and said, oh, you know, I know this person's using the toilet and would rather that my little girl wasn't in the same room as them, then I would have a personal conversation with my friend because we're friends, we've got a, con a dialogue, and I'd say, hey, listen, it's actually making somebody uncomfortable. How do you think we should deal with this? Let's, let's talk about it, because I don't want you to be uncomfortable either, but um, at the end of the day, we have to have this discussion where just because you have rights doesn't mean you don't have responsibilities. What do you think your responsibility is to the people you're not making feel safe? Is it all about you, or are we living in a community? So it's always going to be complex, but I've actually had that <laughs> just a, a little while ago. So I just want to branch out from something that you said, Dave. So you said that when you talk to your friend, you use the pronouns that that person uh, prefers. Uh, I want to touch on the cost, of, the cost of sensitivity. So is there a cost that um, is paid, you know, in light of eternity when, when you... Because um, there'll be some people who, here who think that by, by using the pronouns that this person has preferred, you're giving some ground. And they'll, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. So what, what you said is that you're, you're attempting to be sensitive. So is there a cost that's involved with that, that sensitivity? Yeah, absolutely. So especially as a public person, you have to even more carefully choose the weight of your words. And that's probably not a lot different as a Christian. Because, you know, non-Christians will hold you accountable for your Christianity very, very well. They're better than the Holy Spirit for convicting you sometimes. <laughs> but um, in that context, um, I know my friend knows my position and will not feel any endorsement of, of their, their politics or their ideology by me being friendly. Um, and they'll only see friendliness in it. They won't see, uh, you know, equivocation being... They won't see compromise in that. They know... We, and we've had very great... This particular um, transgender woman is incredibly open to tough conversations. Um, <laughs> I'm blessed in that way, that it wasn't somebody who was there to make a point and try and get me in trouble with the anti-discrimination thought police. I mean, tribunal. Um, so, you know... It is, it is different on each one. So, you know, for the rest of the night, I'd call a transgender woman he um, because there is a cost. In, in a broad, non-specific context, um, it's best that we're as close to truthful as possible. George? Mate, um, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I think if you go through, th this would be the exact reason why, for instance, Pastor Carl Lenz of Hillsong Church in, in New York refuses to have the discussion about homosexuality on TV with all the plethora of interviews he has and on radios and on newspapers and magazines because he, he doesn't want to have a blanket statement that isolates people from coming to know Jesus because they put themselves under that blanket. He says very openly, we will deal with the people one one on one. It's about them personally. It's not an open discussion to have. And so, so I, I, I agree with that scenario. So if a transgender person does come in and wants to be known by a particular pronoun, I don't see any issue with doing that. I, I, we, I don't think it makes me less of a Christian in my belief system that I care for this person, yeah. right? So I care for this person. That's why in that previous question, uh, am I, or in this question, would I be open to toilet facilities? Yes, I would. If we, if, we can, if we can openly show that we still love you and accept you for who you are right now, I don't see Jesus tell Zacharias, get out of that tree and when you stop being a stealer, then I'll come to your house for dinner. He said, get out of the tree and while you're a thief, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, be, I'll have dinner with you. And so I think that's the sort of thought process of that, yeah. All right. Um, Shruti? Just while we're on this, I've, I've been asked a lot of questions from young, uh, young adults as to how do we deal with this when they're around us or, you know, when they're in our friend circle or friends' friends or, you know, who come into our families and how do we deal with this? And I really, I, I say to them, I say, you know, we, something, something that every one of us want to be is we want to be heard, we want to be, we matter. And I think it's important to give them that space to, to talk and respect them enough to actually hear what they have to say. 
And it doesn't mean that I'm not going to make my stand of what I believe in. But by sitting down and actually caring enough to say, I'd really love to know how you actually came to that decision or, you know, what brought you to this place? I, I, and people are not silly. They know if you're being genuine or you're actually going to say something to them. Yeah. Be genuine. Be real. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit, self-control, to just sit, be still, allow the ministering to happen inside of you, and the response will come. And when, you, when you're done listening, you know, say, wow, I've actually, that's interesting. And would you love to hear my stand on this? And majority of the time, people will go, oh, yeah, yeah, tell me, George. I'd like to know. And you've made your stand. You've agreed to disagree. But what have you ultimately done? You have left this table opened for future discussion. Five years down the line, that person recognizes something. He knows or she knows you have left that safe space. You have made that place where you can come back and have a conversation with. And I think that's important for a younger generation coming in, not knowing, oh, what do I say? Let's not run away. Let's actually listen and talk and discuss, but just care enough to listen. All right. So let's go to this next question. How should you respond to someone with a hormone imbalance or who may be a hermaphrodite? So I know this is like 1% of the cases. It's a very small percentage of the cases in the reading I've done, but it's something that, that people tend to bring up in the conversation. They always like that 1% to, to, to validate the rest, right? especially in our topic last week as well. But um, let's go to Shruti on this one just briefly. How do we respond to that? Do you, uh -huh. or, or anyone on the panel, you would like to respond to that? Or if anyone else on the panel would like to... I'd let uh, David go. Yeah, right. Statistically, <laughs> it's 0.0054% uh, according to the 2016 Australian Census. Um, and that's not the biological condition. That would be even less. It was the, the amount of people who identified as something other than male or female was 0.0054%. That's you know, 5.4 people in 100,000. Now, just on the statistics of it, when you have 99.995% of people responding as either male or female, that's pretty statistically, if you've done any stats, that's, that's a binary result. Gender is binary. Mm. Um, somebody asked before, we didn't quite get to the, the you know, what are the secular sources on um, gender thing? Well, go with the ABS, the, you know, the last census. You know, 99.995% of Australians are binary. <laughs> um, but, you know, with this, how should you respond to someone? The same way you would with anybody with a, a hormone imbalance or a genetic, you know, congenital disorder, with compassion. Like, like don't treat them like they're freaks. I mean, everybody's... There's, there's, it's incredibly common that somebody has something with like down syndrome you, you know you you'd love them and treat them like a normal person all they want is dignity and that's exactly how god sees them so maybe the maybe the best answer is how would god respond to someone with a hormone imbalance or or born with a congenital disorder jesus sees them as people entirely deserving of love. think about what they're going to look like when they're in heaven like that's you know that when there's I, I try and do that. When there's somebody who, who looks a little bit awkward or maybe their social manner, is, maybe they don't, you know, they're not as easy to interact with, wait till their spirit is renewed and glorified and, and their body in, you know, in heaven. It's just see that person, um, the image of God on them, and then respond to that. Mm. All right, so time is getting on. So we'll finish off with this question here. Uh, how could I protect my kids from being taught gender theory at schools? So for those who have, have kids on the panel, uh, feel free to respond to this. Uh, look, uh, for me, I've already, I've already gone down this line with our kids' principals. Uh, I've called them and gone to speak to them and just said, look, we, we, we have a very different set of beliefs in regards to gender and um, we believe gender and sex are uh, very, very tied. 
uh, as I've just learned. So there's the consensus. And so, um, uh, so we would like our children to not be, if the school was to, to do that, we'd like to opt them out of that. Um, our kids go to two different schools um, because of their primary and secondary. Uh, one of the schools said, yeah, sure, look, we're not thinking of doing anything like that, so there's no, there's no fear there, but we will have an opt-in, opt-out option if we do. And the other one sort of balked a little bit, even though they didn't have a program. They said, well, we don't know if we, we, we'll have the ability to do the opt-out. Um, and I said, well, uh, I, will, I will pull my kids out of school and, um, and take them to another school if that's the case. So um, if that's what I have to do, that's what we have to do. Um, I don't want our, I don't want our kids. Uh, I, Heather and I have been very big on teaching our children about the ways of God ourselves, right? So, so we're not, we're not, we have no issue te- talking to them about sex or virginity or gender or or anything like it, how you. Well, what are the boundaries between you and your boyfriend and everything? You know, Dad, I don't care if it's Ugh, you're listening to me, right? And that's what we're doing. And so, um, you know, I talk. <laughs> I, I use the toilet paper roll to teach my daughter about. Um, you know, the sacredness of virginity, basically, you know. Um, oh, no, I oh, know. You want to hear that story? No? Yeah, yeah, it's quite, it's like, what? Okay. No, basically, it was just very simple. I just said, you know, she didn't understand what virginity was, you know. And <laughs> it's okay, Shruti, it's okay. You may have to counsel her. Um, <laughs> but what, what I did was I, I, I said, I tried to explain it this way. I literally had a toilet roll in my hand, and I said, hey, look, just the empty one. And I said, look, imagine I gave you this. And I said, I want you to hold this. This is very special to me. I want you to hold it. And it's very, very valuable uh, until I come back. And then I'm gone for three, four, five weeks. And you're, so you're thinking, oh, it's a toilet paper roll. And you're throwing it around and stepping on it and getting rid of it and discarding it and don't care about it and everything. And then you realize, ah, oh, it's all torn and tattered. And then you throw it away. And then I come to you and I say, hey, where's that toilet roll? And you say, oh, I threw it away, Dad. It was all torn and tattered. And I say, darling, that, is a, that was made out of a very rare metal from the Amazon jungle. It's worth $100 million. Why would you throw it away? And she looked at me and I said, well, that's what your virginity is like. We take, we, it's been told that it's cheap and it means nothing, but really it's extremely valuable for you. And so uh, that was four years ago when she was 13 and she still got that toilet paper roll. Um, thank the Lord because she now has a boyfriend and I keep shoving it in her face. So carry on. And then I give the boyfriend the Arab look. Fantastic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, gender and sex, it's a very intricate topic, but what we've heard tonight is that it's important to listen. These people who identify as one of 73 genders, it's a case-by-case thing, it's important to listen to these people. That's, this is how we engage in the conversation. George, why don't you close us in prayer? Father, we just thank you so much, my God, for a night like tonight, for the ability for us as disciples of Jesus Christ to come and learn more so that we can be better at being disciples that we can love people in a better way, we can understand them in a better way, we can understand the ways of the world in order to be able to navigate it in a better way, Father. We thank you that as we go out from this place, any people that we meet that are going through these issues and these dysphorias, that we can be compassionate, we can be loving, but also be truthful, that we can listen to their story, but also be able to share the greatest story of love of all. And we thank you for that, Father, for that opportunity to walk on this mission with you. In your name we say, amen. 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 Well, ladies and gentlemen, these panelists will be out in the foyer. They're going to make their way there now, right now. Let's thank them. Pastor George Saloom, Trudy Hutchison, Dave Pillow, and Amberina Smith. These guys will be in the foyer. So if you have any questions that didn't make it to the screen, you can go ahead and ask them, have a conversation with them, get your answers, and that'll be great. Uh, Don't forget, you can watch, uh, we'll be uploading the service onto our Facebook page. So you can, if you miss something tonight, you want to rewatch it, you can go check that out on our Facebook page. You can also watch the previous, last week's one as well. So go check that out on our Facebook page. Don't forget that uh, Dave Pillow runs an organization called uh, Church and State, and he also runs uh, an online talk uh, talk show called Pillow Talk. So you can also check that out online. There are drinks and nibblies in the foyer. That is all from me. Our next topic uh, for next week will be feminism, feminism and the patriarchy. Where is Jesus in all of this? That's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. All from me. See you guys next week. <laughs>